So I've looked at these slides on the train and I've tried to personalise them a little bit. Um, but this is very much thanks to Simon, who, as I said, sends his apologies. He comes from Salisbury and but has never met these two gentlemen and has no personal relationships with them, uh, but sends greetings from the very beautiful Salisbury Cathedral. So a granuloma is a histological <coughs> definition, an organised collection of macrophages with giant cells, and not to be confused with granulation tissue, so we will not be talking about pyogenic granulomas or vocal cord granulomas. These are collections of granulation tissue in a foreign body re reaction, and they are not granulomas. So we're going to be talking about granulomatous conditions, and if we apply our surgical sieve, um, they can be caused predominantly by infectious reactions, autoimmune, near plastic, or substance abuse. And here's a full list. You can see a huge range of different bacteria. Uh, mycobacteria can cause granulomatous tissue. Inflammatory conditions, near plastic conditions are relatively rare, and cocaine use is not on that list. Now, they typically present with ENT symptoms, and particularly conditions like GPA often present for the first time to an ENT surgeon. But a lot of the symptoms, particularly relating to the nose, are fairly nonspecific. Crusting, nasal obstruction, epistaxis, facial pain, that would cover a large range of conditions that we see from rhinitis to chronic rhinosinusitis. But often with patients with granulomas conditions, they will have other more diffuse symptoms. So ask patients about hearing loss, ear pain, facial palsy, red eye, respiratory problems, particularly stridor. They often feel unwell. They describe just feeling tired and exhausted, more than would account for the severity of their nasal symptoms alone. They may have a cough, shortness of breath, arthralgia, kidney problems, more diffuse symptoms, and that should start to ring the alarm bells. We're looking for signs of granulomatous tissue, so abnormal mucosa in the nose, adhesions and scarring, mucopus coming from the sinuses, nothing unusual in that, a septal perforation <coughs> with unhealthy edges and no other cause that you can attribute it to, saddle deformity, middle ear disease or middle ear effusion, vocal cord thickening, and you might sometimes see a subglottic stenosis. They can also have orbital pseudotumors, so they might have proptosis or visual signs, and things that we're not used to looking at, but skin changes, look at their nails for evidence of petechial hemorrhage, other things that might point you in the direction of a granulomatous condition. Um, this is an endoscopic grading system for vasculitis, so relatively normal mucosa in this one, but you get this slightly abnormal, very friable mucosa to frank crusting and very unhealthy looking mucosa. They often get a secondary staph aureus colonization on top, so they have green crusts in the nose. And the key thing with all of these conditions is to have a very high index of suspicion. Your patient is more unwell than their findings would suggest. There's just something not quite right about them, and they often fail to respond to treatment in the normal way. So they don't respond to, respond to standard medical treatment. They often heal poorly after surgery, get adhesions and chronic post-operative staph aureus infection. That sort of thing. You want to constantly be thinking for the patients that are not quite as straightforward as they seem, is there something else going on? And the key thing is you have to repeat that index of suspicion. So this is a patient who was referred to me, who when she walked in the clinic was the textbook description of GPA, 10 years down the line. She had a terrible saddle deformity, a total septal perforation. She had Bajas for bilateral middle ear disease. You couldn't have got a better picture of GPA. But the referral letter said, please see this lady with all of these conditions, GPA has been excluded. But what they meant by that was they did the anchor test on the first presentation 10 years earlier, and it was written in the notes that she was anchor negative. And in every subsequent clinic letter, she was anchor negative, and therefore it was never repeated. And even though the picture progressed, they didn't repeat the blood test. So, you know, in the early stages, it's difficult to pick these cases up, but you need to keep rethinking and keep retesting. So if I have an index of suspicion, I do some screening blood tests. I usually do an ESR and CRP anchor. Um, C anchor more, more useful in severe GPA. <coughs> Only 90% of patients ever seroconvert, so a negative C anchor does not exclude vasculitis. P anchor more in eGPA or cocaine. Um, elevated seromase in sarcoidosis. I always test for renal function and I measure the eosinophil count. I very rarely use a biopsy. Um, I think it's useful if you need to exclude malignancy. If the blood tests are negative, and my colleagues, particularly in ophthalmology for orbital masses, have a high index of suspicion, it can be useful. Um, but we're often asked to biopsy when we can't find anything, and there's quite good evidence in the literature that there's very little value in biopsying normal mucosa. So if there is an abnormal 
abnormal lesion, obviously diseased mucosa in the nose, it can be useful in supporting the diagnosis. But more often than not, even if we have a septal perforation or inflamed mucosa, the biopsy comes back as showing chronic inflammation. And so it, it's not always as helpful as we would like it to be. It is important to exclude malignancy. <coughs> Imaging is not helpful in the diagnosis, but often involved in part of the workup. The most important thing is working closely with your rheumatological colleagues. So there will often be patients who are anchor negative, who have, I have a high clinical index of suspicion for, and they are very good at finding other signs and symptoms that either support or refute the diagnosis. So this is a patient shared by both Anshul and myself. Um, she's a 26-year-old hospital manager who had terrible recalcitrant chronic sinusitis. Um, I think from a surgical point of view, I had done pretty much everything I could. She just had horrible mucosa that crusted with staph aurea. She kept coming back. She didn't respond to medical therapy, and she felt awful. She was anchor negative, but she did have some particular hemorrhages in her nail beds. Um, and this doesn't show very well, but this is in the maxillary sinus, and she's just got this horrible staph aureus crusting. And again, looking up to the Lothrop cavity, the mucosa is cobblestoned and unhealthy, <coughs> despite being on high doses of prednisolone. She did respond to prednisolone. It's the only thing that got her better. Um, and even though she was anchor negative, I was slightly reluctant. Um, but in conjunction with my rheumatologist, we started on methotrexate. And she's absolutely <coughs> transformed. The mucosa has become normal. Um, and they did find other signs on their examination that did go with the diagnosis of GPA. So it, it may be difficult to get the diagnosis, but you want to keep thinking about it in these more difficult cases. So GPA is probably the most common, formerly known as Wegener's. Um, Wegener was a signed-up member of the Nazi party until 1935, so we're no longer allowed to use his name. Um, and it's a granulomatous condition with polyangitis. It typically presents first in the ENT regions in the head and neck. So we will have quite a major involvement in making the diagnosis. It often affects the lungs and the kidneys. They present with upper respiratory tract infections, stridor, malaise, pallor and arthralgia, and nasal crusting, and that's often the most, most obvious sign. Um, C anchor, about 90% eventually seroconvert with extensive disease, but in the early stages, they're often C anchor negative, and they often get this chronic secondary infection with staph aureus. Um, they can acutely deteriorate, and it used to have 100% mortality before good treatment. So you want to have a, if they are unwell, think about admitting some cases. We need to treat their secondary infections, and that's probably where septrin becomes quite effective in treatment, and we need to involve our rheumatologists in their immunosuppression. Rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, depletes B cells <coughs> and has transformed the care of patients with vasculitis and other B cell-related diseases. So they now do very well. Um, with reasonably good management of, of what can be a very aggressive disease. And these are different manifestations. So middle ear effusion, saddle nose deformity, facial palsies, subglottic stenosis, and blepharitis. So we want to be looking at the whole of the head and neck area and beyond for evidence of GPA. And one other thing about these patients, they are at a much higher risk of head and neck malignancy. And what I didn't realize was they have a five-fold increased risk of lymphoma. So we've had a few patients with long-standing GPA where the picture has changed. They've stopped responding to disease. What was thought to be an orbital pseudotumor has rapidly enlarged, and they've turned out to have lymphoma. So even when you've made the diagnosis, you have to retain that index of suspicion and keep going back and thinking about whether you need to repeat biopsy or tests if the picture changes. <coughs> and the surgical management of the nose is essentially if you can, to do as little as possible. We may biopsy if, it, if needed for the diagnosis. Um, I try and avoid endoscopic sinus surgery if at all possible because they don't heal well and they scar. Um, medical management is key in the management of their sinus disease. It is really important not to put grommets in because they'll end up with horribly discharging sort of chronic ear disease. Um, usually an effusion is easier to aid than a chronically discharging ear. And septal perforations we'll hear more about in the, in the next talk um, but only after disease has been controlled for more than a year. Sarcoidosis is an autoimmune condition affecting predominantly lungs, um, lymph glands, skin, and heart, so we will see less of it. But you can get this malar rash and typical nodular changing in the septum. And lupus pernio is an isolated skin form, which again might present to us in ENT. Uh, the main role here in terms of ENT management is sometimes injecting intralesional steroids into these very localized diseases. Uh, but they will generally be managed in the rheumatology or in the chest clinic. Now, CHIRG, 
wasn't a Nazi, but he did support vagueness, so we're now supposed to call this eGPA, or eosinophilic granuloma, granulomatous disease with polyangitis. Um, again, it's a vasculitis, but this has a slightly different presentation. It has a prodromal stage where they have asthma and nasal polyps. And during this stage, there's very little to pick them out from all our other patients with nasal polyps, other than they tend to recur very early after surgery. So if you have a patient with very difficult to manage polyps, it's certainly something to consider. And they have an eosinophilia, which is more than 10% of their peripheral white blood count, and that's how you pick them up. Difficult to treat asthma, pansinusitis. They may sometimes have significant osteitis or tram railing in their sinus CTs. The problem with these patients is they have this early prodrome, and then they progress quite rapidly to eosinophilia and to the third stage of vasculitis. And in the vasculitic stage, they have a high mortality from cardiomyopathy. So I've been involved in a number of medical legal cases where the diagnosis has been missed quite easily in the early stages. And there's been questions about why wasn't it picked up where the patients have died of cardiomyopathy. So it's, again, having an index of suspicion in a difficult-to-manage polyp and asthma patient. Um, eosinophil count is key, and I think it's worth measuring an eosinophil count in almost all our polyp patients because it's a good prognostic indicator as well. A patient with high levels of eosinophils, even if they don't meet criteria for Chogue stress, are going to have a poorer outcome than those with low eosinophil counts. It will also help direct patients to biologic therapies as they become more available. And again, these patients are going to be managed predominantly in a difficult-to-treat asthma and a vasculitic clinic. I would avoid operating on their sinuses if at all possible because you stimulate very intense osteitis and their sinuses scar down and obliterate very quickly. Now, these are much more rare and weird and wonderful. Uh, rhinoscleroma is a very weird atrophic condition caused by Klebsiella. Um, I've only seen one case and it was very difficult to manage, but, but long-term treatment with ciprofloxacin. Leprosy, um, I've never come across any cases at all. Um, I think Simon has had one, uh, but you're going to think about it very rarely, and particularly spirochetes and syphilis, hopefully now much less common. This is one not to miss, and midline facial granuloma is not a benign granulomatous condition. It's actually a T-cell, NK-cell lymphoma, so again, often with these lesions, we need to biopsy, not to make the diagnosis vasculitis, but most importantly, to exclude malignancy. And what often happens is a superficial biopsy is taken showing nonspecific inflammation, and these diagnoses are often made, made late. So deep biopsies are always required when you're examining these patients, and these patients need urgent and aggressive radiotherapy. Myelospherulosis. Um, it's a foreign body reaction to petroleum-based products. Now, some time ago, there was a fashion of putting Vaseline packs in the nose after FES. And I've got a couple of patients with this where they've got very intense granuloma reactions in their turbinates, and their nose has basically closed completely shut with adhesions. So avoid any Vaseline in the nose, particularly if you have any exposed orbital fat, because it does cause this very intense foreign body reaction. I think this is probably far more common than vasculitis, at least in London. And cocaine-induced midline lesions mimic a lot of the pictures of granulomatous disease, um, and they also may be anchor positive. So it induces a type of low-grade vasculitis that can even continue once they stop using cocaine. Now, these patients almost always deny cocaine use, um, or they admit to it in the past and say that they gave up 10 years ago. Um, never believe them. It's usually what the cocaine is mixed with, this lev <coughs> levamisole, and you get almost complete loss of the nose, se severe saddling, and they usually, you can tell from looking at it, it just looks horrible, but it can be very difficult to distinguish from GPA and other vasculitic conditions. And as I said, just simply do not believe the patient that tells you they've stopped using cocaine. We've recently had a colleague visiting from Barcelona who does a lot of septal perforation repair. And he told me off for being far too trusting of my patients because I took them at their word. So he told me to start testing every patient. So while he was with us, I had 15 patients referred for septal perforation repair. They had promised the referring doctor they'd stopped using cocaine. So we did urinalysis on the day of their first appointment. And of the 15, 11 tested positive for cocaine use. That means that 11 had used it in the three days before coming to see me. Um, which isn't great. So we now do the alibi test, which is unfortunately insisting that somebody checks the urine specimen that comes back out the toilet is warm, because sadly patients will bring a cold sample from a friend to prove that they're no longer using it. Um, maybe it's just London, uh, but this is a really big problem for us. 
So if they test positive, we send them off to a drug uh, rehabilitation centre and then we insist on three negative random tests before we repair their septal perforation. Fungal disorders of the nose, I'm just going to cover very briefly. There are four main types, <coughs> uh, invasive and non-invasive. These are found in immunocompetent patients. These are found in immunocompromised patients. Simple fungal ball or allergic disease and then invasive disease. So aspergilloma is very common, particularly found in the maxillary sinus. Um, it could be a foreign body from amalgam, quite common after epistaxis, and you get this intense foreign body reaction. Fungal balls or fungi chelate heavy metals, so you get this calcific deposit and this horrible, cheesy, nasty stuff that you have to come out. The only treatment for these is surgical debridement. You need a big hole to get it all out, and then they do very well and generally don't come back. Allergic fungal rhinosinusitis is an IgE-mediated allergic disease. So we all have fungal spores in our nose, but a significant proportion of patients with aspirin-sensitive uh, disease also have fungal allergies, and they get very intense inflammatory mucin. And you'll all recognize it sometimes. You get the mucus in the sucker, you try and pull the sucker out the nose, and this mucus springs back about two feet. Um, they have very early recurrence of their polyps, and the treatment is not with antifungals because you can't get rid of the fungus, uh, but with steroids and immunosuppression to dampen down their allergic reaction. There is probably a role for immunotherapy in these patients, um, but it's not been very well explored at present. And then the invasive fungal diseases are found in immunocom immunocompromised patients. So chronic, often in diabetics. Um, these are quite indolent. You'll often get destruction in the nose. They can be quite difficult to make the diagnosis. Um, Treatment is the same for both forms, but aggressive surgical debridement with antifungals and the acutely invasive fungal, again, in particularly immunocompromised patients, these have a very rapid course. So they come in often in extremis. You might see necrosis on the, on the hard palate or in the nasal cavity. It often spreads very rapidly to the orbit into the intracranial cavity. So these patients need very aggressive management, both of their immunocompromised state, but also surgical debridement. And that will often involve orbital exenteration or more extreme surgery to take away all of the disease if the patient's going to survive. Um, the new systemic antifungals such as ambizone have transformed care because they have much lower nephro and, and liver toxicity than, than some of the old drugs, but these are still very difficult patients to manage. So I'm sorry for the very brief fly-through, um, and apologies that the slides um, are mostly not my own, but thank you very much to Simon. Um, Granulomas conditions essentially require a very high index of suspicion to pick up, and you certainly need to involve a rheumatologist to manage these patients well. Thank you.